The Magna Carta, the Black Death, the Hundred Years' War, and the Dark Ages of Britain were actually quite crazy. Yet life for common people was not easy in those years. Though England was flourishing during the medieval times, the living standards in the country were just pretty gross back then. Welcome to Nutty History. From the stench of the River Thames to bread that would make you trip balls, here is what life was like in Dark Ages England. A piss poor prescription. Even though the Middle Ages happened almost a thousand years after the basic development of medical science in Greece, there wasn't much progress in between when it comes to the science of healing. It was still based on the work of Greek physicians like Galen and Hippocrates, and religion played a big part in the healing process, calling it the divine regulation. You know what else didn't change much in those thousand years? War. In fact, one could argue that there was more warring in the Middle Ages on a regular basis than the bloodshed that occurred during antiquity. More warring means more battles, and more battles meant more casualties and wounded people. But it had become a common practice in many areas of Europe, like England by then, to have physicians ready to tend to wounded soldiers on the battlefield. However, unlike the modern doctors, these doctors didn't have a lot of gear packed in a bag to carry to the battlefield. In fact, as doctors were pretty much exclusively men back then, they came equipped with the tools to sterilize wounds as soon as possible. We're not saying ladies wouldn't be able to do that, but you'll see why here in just a sec. Yes, we are talking about the urine draining organ in the human body. Doctors would just whip out their tools and peel on the wound to stop it from festering. Of course, it was gross, but it worked. Urine is heavily rich in ammonia, which is a pretty good sterilizing agent. It would keep cuts from getting infected. This was a time when most of these cuts were a matter of life and death, so that much indignity was worth it. The doctors probably carried canisters of water instead of medical kits to field duty during those times. Fresh urine was also used to treat sores, burns, bites, and pretty well anything you could think of as an ailment. Would you let one of your friends pee on your wound? Can I just pee on my own wound? Let us know in the comments. Vampire Fish Dessert So let me ask you something. Do you know how King Henry I of England died in 1135? Gluttony. The man may look lean and slightly undernourished in his portrait, but boy, he could eat. He had a peculiar taste for a certain delicacy as well, and that's what caused his death. On his deathbed, his chronicler, Henry of Huntingdon, proclaimed that the king had passed away from a surfeit of lampreys. Now, if you don't know what a lamprey is, look at it now. Believe it or not, that thing doesn't come from space. It is very much a Mother Earth's child and commonly known as the vampire fish. This bizarre fish is an extreme predator that tends to latch onto its prey and eat away their host by burrowing inside them. Oh, God, I could barely get that out. Not exactly something one liked to have on their dinner table, but it was a delicacy for British royals and nobility for centuries during the Dark Ages. And it didn't go out of fashion after the Dark Ages entirely. The creepy creature was even served at Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953 in the form of a lamprey pie. Mmm, who don't like pie? They may have fallen out of popular items on the menu in Britain, but lampreys are still eaten widely in other European countries like Spain and Finland. Lice, lice, baby. In one of his prominent plays, King Henry IV Part II, William Shakespeare wrote an unforgettable line. Uneasy is the head that wears the crown. And he wasn't wrong, especially because it is very possible that Henry IV's head was teeming with lice. Now don't take our word, Adam of Us confirmed it when he attended King Henry IV's coronation in 1399. But King Henry IV having head lice wasn't much of an extraordinary sight despite him being a king because he happened to live in the Middle Ages. There is always an argument among historians if the Dark Ages were truly dark. And as a matter of fact, there is a substantial amount of evidence against it. But if the Dark Ages were called the Filthy Ages, then everybody would have agreed. We can talk about filth of the Middle Ages right after this section, but let's talk about head lice for now. Pretty much everyone in medieval England struggled with lice and fleas, from the rich to the poor, and having lice was no respecter of the class. People had made lice picking a regular tradition that they would do at least weekly. They would gather together and help each other get rid of lice, just like you may see apes doing it in the wilds. Truly a sign of us being related. For people who were traveling, it was even more common for them to pick lice at taverns and houses of their host. 
If one was a knight, that makes it even worse because how would you scratch your head with metal gauntlets on your hands and that cumbersome visor on your head? That's a lot of work for temporary relief from something that may distract you on the battleground. So these crusaders and knights would hire washerwomen to do the traveling with them. Now these women would not only keep their laundry fresh and clean, well as much as they could back then, they would also help keep knights to keep their heads parasite free. Filthy Front Yards Okay, with lice out of the hair now, we can talk about the filth problem of medieval England. You probably already are aware of how bathing was considered an invitation to sickness after the Black Death happened and turned people away from the bathhouses. But bathing was the least important problem if we're going to talk about the sanitary issues of the Dark Ages. It was common for the common people to sleep on the common floor of the house, which was mostly just dirt and rocks and was also the home of rats, spiders, and insects. People would cover the earthen floor often with rushes, herbs, and grass, and rarely clean the area. One Dutch visitor complained that English homes were harboring expectoration, vomiting, the leakage of dogs and men, ale, dropping, scraps of fish, and other abominations not fit to be mentioned. Now, if you think the insides of homes were dirty, let's talk about the front yard. There was no plumbing system back then in England, so they would use chamber pots for excrement and rotting food that had to be disposed of somewhere. Now, by the king's law, they were supposed to gather up their whole mess and carry it outside the city limits. But, in all seriousness, who would like to make a trip to the city border every single day? On foot, while carrying a stinking pile in a pot? Yeah, no one, especially when there was a perfectly good street to dump stuff instead of walking on it for miles and then dump stuff. Trash piled up in front of people's homes, ranging from old chicken bones to emptied out chamber pots, stinking the whole city like the belly of a sewer. Talking about sewers, the rain made the conditions even more horrendous because the streets of medieval England were made of dirt and cobblestone, designed to slope into a rainwater ditch in the middle of the road to prevent flooding. Now with trash everywhere, these ditches would get jammed within minutes of a downpour, and then instead of stopping floods, these ditches would overflow with vengeance and stench that carried all sorts of diseases that were incurable back then. When War Became a Spectacle there were several reasons behind why England and France locked horns for more than a hundred years in the aptly titled Hundred Years' War. From the inheritance of the throne of the French Kingdom to the sweet, sweet wine the English were importing from Flanders. But nobody would have thought that this war would one day turn into entertainment. In the early years of the conflict, England made quick strides in French territories and put France on the back foot, forcing them to hire anyone and everyone to fight their cause. They hired Genoese mercenaries and sea pirates alike to slow down the English offensive, but the English longbows were proving wild cards for England. In 1351, the war had come to a stalemate pretty much in Brittany. The House of Montfort was controlling the castle of Plormel with support from England, and the castle of Jocelyn was under the control of the House of Blois, supported by France. The tug of war between the two sides involved occasional raiding in each other's territory, but neither of the sides was budging. Tension was so thick that the correspondence between the captain of the House of Blois, Jean de Beaumanois, and the captain of the House of Montfort, Robert Benborough, got too personal. Jean de Beaumanois was so riled up he challenged Captain Benborough to a duel to decide the fate of the Duchy of Brittany. To raise the stakes, Benborough suggested a tournament instead. They agreed to each bring 30 men, knights, and squires to a predetermined battlefield and fight until one side was defeated. Sort of like chess. The fact that the combat of the 30 was recorded by chronicler Froissart, the real reason behind the beef between the two captains, was never disclosed. The venue for this combat was a site midway between the Breton castles of Jocelyn and Plormel, and the crowds gathered to watch and cheer at the spectacle in a proper gathering where refreshments and snacks were served as knights clashed their swords for hours. They even stopped the battle for a timeout and allowed the wounded to be treated. After a hard fought battle, the Franco-Breton alliance led by Captain de Beaumanois came out on top with nine English combatants losing their lives and Captain Benborough surrendered. They'll never take our freedom. Even though the King of the Scots, John Balliol, surrendered to King Edward I of England at Brecon on July 10, 1296, the Scottish landholders were not so keen to call the English king their king. This resulted in a revolt in Scotland and among the Scottish rebellion leadership was the Braveheart, Sir William Wallace. Wallace marched to Stirling with Andrew Moray of Petty to meet the English forces for an important battle. Pretty sure the English side was aware of the importance of this battle as well. Led by the Earl of Surrey, 
The English tried to negotiate with the rebels, but Sir Wallace was adamant about fighting despite the English side having 2,000 cavalry and 7,000 infantry, in comparison to the Scots, who only had 300 cavalry and 5 to 6,000 infantry. And yet, the English made a comedy of errors out of the battle. When Wallace's response reached the English camp, they immediately charged across the River Forth to meet the Scots. But then they realized that their leader, John de Warren, 6th Earl of Surrey, wasn't with them. The Earl was still sleeping at the camp, so the English retreated. The Scots cut a part of their army at Stirling Bridge, and all of a sudden, the English lost their advantage. Nearly the entire English vanguard was eliminated brutally, while the rest of their army helplessly looked on. It is said that after victory, the Scots desecrated the body of the English second-in-command, Hugh de Cressingham, and distributed pieces of his skin as souvenirs to the soldiers. Hallucinogenic Bread The 16th century physician Paracelsus made a profound remark about what is poison. He said, all things are poison and nothing is without poison. The dose alone makes a thing not poison. Agriculture was still a very weather-dependent industry back in the Dark Ages, and the preservation technology for crops was also bare minimum. So the crop management was entirely dependent on hopes that grain wouldn't go stale or get infected before the new crop was ready at the end of the summer. If it did, then they had to resort to using old rye, which is often infected to make bread. Rye kernels usually get infected by ergot, a purple, talon-like outgrowth that got its name from the French word argo, which means cockspur, as the French found the outgrowth reminiscent of a rooster's spur. When ergot-infected grain is milled into flour and consumed, a whole host of troubles arise. Convulsions and seizures, vivid hallucinations, often of demons or animals, a restriction of blood flow to the extremities, followed by a falling off of gangrenous limbs. Poor English people had to often consume that bread to survive the remainder of the summer, during the Dark Ages, and there was no means to control the dosage because it was part of the most important component of all three meals in a day. I mean, you gotta have your bread. Ergot was used by the Eleusinian Mysteries cult in a controlled dosage for the initiation ceremony of new members in Greece. Male fashion was poking out. In the Middle Ages, expanding trade led to a host of new fashions, most of which were accessible only to the very wealthy. From bob ass sleeves to the pointy hat of Robin Hood to even pointier clown-like shoes, there are lots of medieval English trends that may make you facepalm. But there was one particular item that outright challenged the age of modesty in the face. Apparently, leaving something to the imagination was out of trend in the 14th century, and fueling people's imagination was in. The most controversial item on the fashion list of the 1300s was a doublet called a court piece. It was a teeny tiny piece of cloth that only drooped down two inches below the belt. Men would wear nothing but their undergarments with it, which were basically leggings of the 14th century. But also, these leggings were the tightest and thinnest, giving lookers a good silhouette to figure out what's there underneath, and tailors were asked to make the bulge look as prominent as possible. By the 16th century, these court pieces evolved into protruding cod pieces that were worn even during battles. More often than not, they were even custom designed to be pointing out. The poster boy for Bulba's extensions was, of course, none other than Henry VIII. You can visit the Tower of London to see a portrait of Henry VIII with his cod piece in all its glory. I believe they called it Crotch's Bulbous. Modesty Fashion Trend while men expressed their masculinity rather profanely with court pieces and cot pieces during the later years of the Middle Ages, women were expected to be the idols of modesty. In fact, most of their clothing was divinely regulated by the Bible. The social classes were considered assigned by the gods and one had to dress according to their social status. A serf should dress raggedly as a serf would, and queens must dress like a wealthy queen should. Still, that doesn't mean one was allowed to be gaudy. I mean, even in prosperity, one was supposed to follow the teachings of the Bible and dress with a sense of modesty. The Hinnon hats gained popularity among women pretty quickly after Marco Polo brought one from Mongolia. In Genghis Khan's Mongolia, hats were the only item that was different for genders in an otherwise homogenous clothing system. The shape and design of Hinnon hats also matched the trend of plucking eyebrows and forehead hair that women were doing. Physicians believed back then that female body hair must be a sign of humoral imbalance, meaning that something must be wrong. So to save shame, they shaved it all the same. I'm over here rhyming. Hidden hats worked best with this look to showcase those large foreheads, but the Christian leaders like Friar Thomas found the fad extremely immodest and thus against the religion. 
He even asked his followers to yank the hen and hats off women if they found someone wearing them. Well, that's all for today. Tell us in the comments what else about the Dark Ages would you like to know. Thanks for watching Nutty History, and do share, like, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and would like to see more videos like this one.